Hello, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this is now Lesson 191 in our series called Understanding the Jews. And tonight's lesson is entitled Ahab and Jezebel, Part 6. So last week, we left King Ahab and the prophet Elijah on the road that leads to Samaria. They had finally met up with each other after Elijah had been hiding from Ahab for three and a half years, a period during which the drought that was predicted by Elijah had waxed so dire that the very survival of Ahab's kingdom was in question. And after these two men had essentially blamed each other uh, for this ongoing catastrophe, <clears throat> Elijah was about to make a proposition to Ahab. A proposition that would settle the matter once and for all. So that's where we're going to resume our study tonight, and that takes us to 1 Kings chapter 18, and now we will hear what Elijah has on his mind. These are his words, 1 Kings 18 and verse 19. The scripture reads, Now therefore send, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal. 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So we don't really have to strain at a gnat to see what this is. This is a showdown. Elijah's clearly setting up a showdown. And it's going to be a contest for the ages. Nothing less than one of the greatest battles recorded between good and evil. Elijah has identified all of the relevant details. Name the field of battle, the participants, and the audience. And every one of these elements must have seemed exceedingly favorable to Ahab. He must have thought that, well, he couldn't have put himself in a better position if he tried. So let's start with the location of this contest, Mount Carmel. And I'm going to first show you a topographical map so you can better visualize the landscape. And I'm going to do that because if you have pictured in your mind uh, a mountain that looks like Mount Hermon or even Mount Fuji or any other of a number of mountains that are exemplified by a singular peak rising up to the skies, well, you would not be getting the right visual. That's not Mount Carmel. So let's take a look at it on the first map. We're calling this Exhibit 186. And let me get my pointer out here. And I want you to notice that Carmel is nothing like a single promontory. Nope. Instead, it's actually a long mountain ridge that has many peaks, many variations in its structure. It runs on a trajectory. Now I want to get my, okay, beginning here from northwest down to the southeast. And it does so for about 24 miles. Uh, it's beginning in the northwest is, I said northeast before, I meant northwest to southeast. Uh, and beginning in the northwest, it's very near to the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see clearly here's the Mediterranean Sea up here, and here's the end of the ridge. And included in that ridge, on this ridge, by the way, varies between four and five miles wide, are places that have 
fairly flat open areas and plateaus, ones that are surrounded by cliffs and outcroppings that either on the one hand provide a commanding view or on the other obscure it. So if you were on the eastern slope uh, of this particular range, and I'll put this back up here again, if you're on the eastern slope, then you would be above the Jezreel Valley on the other side, looking towards central Israel. And if you're on the other side, the western slope, the western slope would be, well, let me see if I can get this to work here. There we go. The western slope over here. Well, if you're on that side, you would be looking at the coastal area that dips down and ends at the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And this is where the battle of good and evil is going to take place, on that western slope. Importantly, the place called Carmel was one of the high places used for worship. And it was a place that had existed there for many years, uh, centuries in fact. And there were two altars there, one old and one new. Altars that had been set up in one of those open areas that I was talking about. An area that could accommodate a very large number of worshipers. And I want to show you next an example that shows one of these areas. And this next exhibit is an actual photo from Mount Carmel. Now, it may or may not be the actual site of the coming contest involving Elijah, but whether it is or not, it will serve our purposes. It will give you a visual, a more accurate visual, of an area on Mount Carmel that was available for the construction of an altar, and one that would fit the description as given in tonight's passage of Scripture. So let's look at Exhibit 187. Again, this is Mount Carmel, but this is an actual photograph. And you can easily see how an area like this could be the site of an event uh, or the type of event that we're about to review. And I'm showing you this second slide for a second reason. Because it will definitely add some understanding and some perspective when we get near the end of this event on Carmel. And we're going to come back to this exhibit when we get there. So at the first, the older of these two altars that had been built in this high place was originally set up ostensibly to worship the true God. And I'll have more to say that about that a little bit later. By the time period that we're studying now in 1 Kings 18, that altar had been broken down and it was no longer being used. During the time of Ahab, the time of this contest, there was a new altar there. Yeah, a new altar. And that high place, the place that used to worship the God of Abraham, was instead being used to worship Baal. The very God, small g, that Elijah was proposing to take on. So, if you're King Ahab, you had to be thinking, what better place for me to be on the side of Baal. What better place than on the very site where he was being worshipped? You could pretty accurately call this place Baal's outdoor temple. There could be no other place where his power would have been greater than right there. So right off the top, 
Ahab has to love the place that Elijah has chosen for this contest. And next on our pre-event preliminaries are the participants. Who are the contestants? Who is it that will be representing their respective God? On the one side, we have this invitation going out to the 450 prophets of Baal, King Ahab's spiritual advisors, along with 400 prophets of Asherah, or if you prefer the alternate name of Ashtaroth. That's the female version of Baal, favored by Jezebel. So on the one side, we have 850 prophets contending for Baal and Asherah. And on the other side, we have just one man, little old Elijah. 850 to 1. Now, I don't know if Ahab was a gambling man, but any gambler would be very happy with those kinds of odds. Remembering that the scripture tells us that Ahab was already sold out to Baal. He was committed to him. His trust was already in Baal. And now Ahab's thinking this. Elijah wants to give me 850 of my prophets against him. I'll take that bet. And the last of Elijah's prerequisites goes to the witnesses. And for that element, Elijah calls all Israel to be invited. Of course, not everyone is going to respond. And even given the very large area, similar to the one I showed you, uh, that's going to be used for this contest, even that was not going to hold every last man in the country of Israel. But that open invitation would at least guarantee an exceptionally large number of witnesses. This epic challenge was going to draw a crowd. And apparently, this was one of those cases where both of these men were totally satisfied with the ground rules. And we can see that by King Ahab's response. And let's go to 1 Kings 18 and verse 20 to get it. The scripture reads, so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. So as you can see, there's no evidence here that Ahab asked Elijah to change anything. We're only told that he sent out a notice and an invitation throughout the whole kingdom. Everybody that had an interest was being encouraged to come to see what was surely going to be a great spectacle. But in addition to that notice, we find something else in this verse that raises a really good question. And the question is this. Verse 20 says that Ahab gathered the prophets. Now we know that Elijah specifically invited a total of 850 prophets. And the 450 prophets of Baal did in fact present themselves. But not the 400 prophets of Asherah. They were a no-show. And as we go through the events of that day, their absence will make itself known. Because they are not mentioned in connection with any of the proceedings. Oh, the prophets of Baal certainly were, but not them. 
But why didn't they come? Did they find some excuse not to be there? And if they did come up with an excuse, why would they have felt the need for one? Or perhaps it's possible that King Ahab decided that he just wasn't going to invite them. Why he would do that, I don't know. But if he did invite them, and they didn't show, you know that would have been a bad sign for Ahab. That would have given them some bad vibes. Right at the outset, given his superstitious nature, he would have taken their refusal to come as some kind of a bad omen, right? And I'd love to share the reason for their absence. I just don't know what it is. On that score, got a lot of questions, but no answers. A lot of speculation, but no facts. So, we'll just have to accept that the mystery of the 400 prophets of Asherah will have to remain just that, a mystery. So let's continue with what we can know. Back to the scriptures, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. The scripture reads, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long Halt ye between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So now we're at the point where everybody that was going to attend this contest was present. And Elijah stands before that huge assembly to pose the issue of the day. Namely, who do you believe to be the true God? Is it the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Or is it Baal? That's a good question. It's the right question. And it's a fair question. So what's the problem? The problem was that Elijah got no answer. Didn't get a yes or a no or a maybe. He got nothing. The fact that Elijah got no answer substantiated the truth as to the way he addressed them. He said, How long halt ye between two opinions? How long are you going to be wishy-washy, unstable, and depending on the circumstances, or perhaps who it is that you're trying to please? going back and forth between God and Baal. And we've all heard the axiom, silence is golden, or that it's better to speak less and listen more. And they're both generally true. Most often it's good advice, but not always. There are times when a person is called upon to speak and for them to declare where they stand. Elijah said, look, you believe in Baal? And say so. And if in the God of Abraham, then say so. But clearly, by the complete silence of the people, they were not willing to take a stand one way or the other. The 
people were in a place that was unsustainable. You may remember Pastor Johnson's series on the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically in Matthew 6, 4, where Jesus told the people that they could not serve two masters. They would eventually become servants of one or the other. Just a matter of time. So that sad, that sad circumstance is where the people of Israel found themselves on that day. And Elijah continued on. 1 Kings 18.22 Scripture reads, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. What Baal's prophets are 450 men. So Elijah declares to the people, to their shame, that he, Elijah, is the only prophet of God left in all of Israel. Now to that you may ask a fair question. What about those Hundred prophets that Obadiah hid by fifties in a cave. What about them? Well, again, our pastor reminded us a few weeks ago that there are prophets who are foretellers and there are prophets who are foretellers. The foretellers may or may not be what we can call full prophets. Some prophets are those who, through study and prayer, can tell forth, T-H, and explain God's word. Those type of prophets seem to be the type that Obadiah was hiding from, Jezebel. And then there are those prophets who have been anointed by God to receive direct communication from God, which they in turn relay to the people. And that word may be in the form of divine doctrine, which is what Moses often received, or in the form of future revelation, the kind that we're attaching to Daniel a lot. But on top of all that, I want to refer to a definition of a full prophet that I gave you way back in the very first few lessons of this current series. And it was simply this. A prophet <clears throat> is a representative of God to the people, as opposed to a priest, who is a representative of the people to God. But here's the thing, we have no evidence that those other <clears throat> 100 prophets had been anointed by God to receive direct revelation from him. No evidence of that. And furthermore, it's obvious that only Elijah was ready, willing, and listen, and able to carry out the office of prophet on that day on Mount Carmel. There was literally no one else. Elijah was the only full prophet standing. Now I know he had a conversation with God later on Mount Sinai. We'll get to that and we'll explain why this is different. And after pointing out his lonely position, Elijah points to his opposition. Now, there was no giant to oppose him, as was the case with David and Goliath. Instead, Elijah shows that he has a numbers problem. He has 450 prophets of Baal to go against. Sheer numbers. I'm going to assume that everybody or most everybody in that crowd had to be thinking, 
This was not a fair fight. How can the prayer of just one prophet overcome the joint appeal of 450? But be that as it may, the stage had been set and the proceedings were to begin. Let's go to 1 Kings 18, two verses now, 23 and 24. The scripture reads, let them therefore give us two bullocks. This is Elijah speaking. And let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So now we finally see what exactly this contest is going to entail. And it's elegantly simple. Elijah says that both he and the prophets of Baal will lay a sacrifice on top of an altar. But here's the key. The wood underneath will not be lit. And whichever God sends fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice of his servant or servants will be declared the true God. One sacrifice will be accepted, and one will not. Now, when it comes to effective demonstrations, Elijah just couldn't have come up with one that would have been better. The crowd could very easily see who the winner of this contest was going to be. There would not have been any bad seats on Mount Carmel that day. Every last person in attendance could not miss a bolt of fire coming down from above their heads into that clearing. The clearing where those two altars had been set up. And neither could they miss which of the two altars was the recipient of that fire. The outcome would leave no doubt. The result of this contest was going to be clear and convincing. There could be no denying what thousands of eyes had just seen. It was a collective experience. So, we have to give Elijah credit for the simplicity and the effectiveness of the test that he had proposed. And all the people that were assembled were in agreement that Elijah's challenge was fair and that it would definitely settle the question at hand. And it was fair. How could anybody say that it wasn't? King Ahab and the prophets of Baal, well, they couldn't make the argument that this wouldn't settle the matter clearly would, so they were stuck. There was no way they could back out now. They had to follow through with this. All the people up there were watching. But before we finish patting Elijah on the back, we need to deal with something of consequence. And it is this. This whole event had a serious problem. And for Elijah himself to call for it requires an explanation. There has been no unanimity 
in the explanations that have been proposed. So what's the big problem? Well, Lord willing, I want to begin our study next week by getting right into it. We'll state the problem, and then we'll review some of the ideas that have been proposed to get past it. In the interim, please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list, and until next time, Shalom.